Specialty Stories podcast, session number seven. Whether you are a pre-med or a medical student, you've answered the calling to become a physician. Soon you'll have to start deciding what type of medicine you'll want to practice. This podcast will tell you the stories of specialists from every field to give you the information you need to make sure you make the most informed decision possible when it comes to choosing your specialty. And welcome back to the Specialty Stories podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, a former Air Force flight surgeon, now turned professional podcaster, I guess. This is the Specialty Stories podcast. If you are new here, I also host the Pre-Med Years, which is our longest running podcast now with over 218 podcasts and the old pre-meds podcast at 58 episodes and the MCAT podcast now around 26, I believe. So go check out all of those podcasts. However you're listening to this, you can listen the best way through a podcast app on your iOS device, on your Android device. Just search for MedEd Media and you'll find all of the podcasts that we do here. This week's episode is a great one speaking to a hospitalist and the path that it takes to be a hospitalist and traits and everything else that we talk about here every week on the Specialty Stories podcast. My name is Shoshana Ungerleiter, and I practice uh, hospital medicine at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. Is that an academic hospital? You know, it is. We're technically set in a community setting, but we actually have uh, several residencies, including internal medicine residents there, and I am on the teaching faculty. Okay. And how long have you been practicing? I've been practicing medicine for just over three and a half years now. I finished residency in 2013. When did you know you wanted to be a hospitalist? I think it was midway through internal medicine residency. So sort of the middle of that second year, I was doing a bunch of night float months, meaning that, you know, you work something like 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. and admitting patients to the hospital overnight, as well as doing cross cover, which I really loved. So it was basically halfway through that I thought to myself, gosh, you know, I, I could really be happy in a hospital setting. There were other, you know, other specialties that I considered, including critical care and cardiology, but ultimately felt like hospital medicine was a good fit for me. And why do you think that? Why was it a good fit? I like the variety of patients that I see, variety in terms of, you know, age, the illness they're and the chief complaint they're kind of walking through the door with, as well as different levels of acuity. You know, we take care of patients who come in the hospital for a routine, you know, hip surgery, um, who are otherwise pretty healthy. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, we co-manage ICU patients who are, you know, incredibly ill and and spend, you know, days or weeks in the intensive care unit, you know, before transitioning out. So I really enjoy the variety there. What traits do you think lead to being a good hospitalist? Good question. Well, I think I'll, I'll say first that, you know, there are many, well, at least within my medical group of hospitalists, there's lots of different kinds of people. So lots of different personalities, I think, can be happy doing hospital work. I think that traits would be, obviously, you, you know, you enjoy talking with patients, given that, you know, as, as internists, that's a lot of what we do. I think you really have to be kind of curious and uh, maintain intellectual curiosity throughout your years in practice, because, you know, things are constantly changing as far as how we manage common medical problems all the time. And so staying up on the literature is incredibly important. I think, you know, I very often find myself looking up, gosh, have the guidelines changed around treating pneumonia? Or, you know, what do we do in the case of, of sepsis? And so no matter where you are sort of in your training and then beyond, I think it's, you know, incredibly important for hospitalists to, to stay up on the literature. I think that's important actually for all, all physicians, but specifically for hospitalists, given that we treat so many different types of, of issues. And um, I also think that given 
depending on your work setup, you might be working different hours. So some some of our hospitalists, you know, work a swing shift. So it's 3 p.m. to 2 a.m. For example, I work at night. So I prefer to work, you know, 9 p.m. to, to 8 a.m. And so I think a bit of flexibility really is helpful. I think people that, you know, love the structure of an 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. job are much better suited for, you know, a clinic or an outpatient practice where you sort of know when you're going to be seeing patients. Whereas with with hospital medicine, the flexibility has to come in because you don't really know how busy the ER is going to be on any given day. So kind of rolling with the punches there. Yeah. Describe a typical day. Well, for me, it's a typical night. (laughs) So I show up at the hospital at about 9 p.m. or just a little before and check in with my colleagues who have been on sort of the afternoon or evening shift and go and uh, grab the admission pager from them. So as a nighttime doc, the majority of what I do is admit new patients to the hospital. And the majority of those patients come through the emergency room. Sometimes we get direct admissions from specialists or primary care docs where the patient comes directly to the floor or we get a transfer from another hospital. But I would say probably at least 75%, if not 85% of of patients just come directly through the emergency room. And so the minute I get there, uh, usually the pager starts going off and our emergency room physician colleagues are are calling to ask us to come and uh, see patients in the ER. So I spend the majority of my night in the emergency department seeing patients and working with the residents. So we, at my hospital, we have two or three residents on every night. And so we work together to see patients and get them admitted to the hospital. We um, often, you know, see them together or the resident will go in and and chat with the patient first, do a history and physical, and then I'll come in later and uh, follow up with more questions. And then we do a modified sort of rounds at night where the the residents present their H&P to me, and then we talk through the assessment and plan. And on occasion, there will be some uh, cross cover fires to put out up on the floor where patients become ill overnight. And uh, I, I need to read up on, you know, the history of, of that patient and figure out what to do in the moment. And so sometimes that can get a little exciting. <laughs> Was there a decision process for you for choosing a, an academic hospital versus a strict community hospital that didn't have residents? When I finished residency, I was, you know, in the typical search for a job and I was confined to this area, meaning the San Francisco Bay area, because I knew I wanted to stay here. And it just so happened that I found a job working in the community for the first two years after I uh, finished residency. It was a bit of a commute for me. And I got a sense of sort of what, what it means to be in community hospital medicine. And I r- really enjoyed it. And I love the group I was working with. But I really found myself after two years missing the educational aspects of working with residents and other trainees. And so decided to come back to the institution where I trained and felt like it was coming home. It was really wonderful. And and now for the last year, I've been back working with the residents in the hospital that where, where I trained. So I think that working with, with residents keeps me on my toes. They often know about sort of the latest and diagnostics and therapeutics. And so we really learn from each other, which I always thought was like a weird thing to say. Once you're in attending, you're supposed to know all these things and really be up on, on everything. And it's and the reality is you can't be always up on everything. And so to me, I thrive in a in a team environment where again, you know, we can learn from each other. And I really think that's for me the beauty of of medicine as a career, continuing to kind of push yourself to always be learning more, recognizing that, as I said, you know, medicine changes from week to week as to sort of what the standard of care is and new information that comes out. So I find it, you know, really exciting. And I love working in an academic environment. Do you have to take call as a hospitalist? Well, technically speaking, you know, we're kind of on call. I mean, so when for the daytime hospitalists, they have a you know a panel of patients that they round on and check in on and make a, a plan for the day, whether it's staying in a hospital, being transferred to a different level of care, or being discharged home. And so for those for the daytime docs, it's usually their the time frame in which they're physically in the hospital is pretty well laid out. 
And then for those of us that, you know, work a, a later swing shift or a night shift, we obviously have to physically be in the hospital. So in that sense, we're sort of, when we're working, we are quote, you know, on call. That said, when our shift is over and we've handed off our, our patients to the next team coming in, we turn the pager off. We don't, I don't get called in the middle of the day while I'm asleep. That's the work of the, my daytime colleagues. So it's really shift work. And technically speaking, you know, we don't have to be on call. We're just working hard when we're in the hospital. What do the shifts look like as far as number of times per week or month? For me, I work part-time, and so it's, it's somewhat different than most hospitalists. It, what's interesting about hospital medicine as a field is it's, it's fairly young, and so many hospital groups sort of figure out what works best for them as far as typical shifts. So very often you'll find you know, hospitalist groups who have a seven-on, seven-off schedule where they work seven days, and then they get seven days off. And so it's, you know, throughout the, the months of the year, except for, you know, several weeks of, of holiday that you get your seven on seven off other people do, you know, a three to a five day stretch and then have time off. And so they can tailor it around their own sort of personal schedules with families and such. For me, I fill in when the uh, full-time nighttime doctors need a break or have, you know, family leave or vacation. So I'm lucky in that I get lots of time off to do other things, but I would say typically for nighttime doctors, they do anywhere from 10 to 15 nights a month as full-time. And it does actually, it's nice to have several days off during a month when you're working full-time, just given that, you know, flipping your clock from uh, night to day and day to night can take a bit of a toll. What does residency look like to get to be a hospitalist? Well, for internal medicine hospitalists, meaning, you know, taking care of uh, adult patients, you complete three years of, of residency training and you're fairly well equipped to right away go into a hospitalist practice. So there are hospitalist fellowships that exist that they're not so common, but so if, if, you know, you want more training in hospital-based care, it's out there. But I would say for the vast majority of people that become hospitalists, you can go straight in after residency into a hospitalist practice. So really the, the big difference between an internal medicine physician and a hospitalist is just the place of practice. Well, I would say, you know, to be clear, the internal medicine hospitalists are internal medicine doctors. The sort of the distinction is the career that, you know, you, you could choose straight out of internal medicine residency is primary care, meaning you're in an outpatient practice seeing ambulatory patients, or you can become a hospitalist, right? As you're saying, where you work solely in the hospital. Some people do a hybrid of both, but I would say it's, it's much more common to choose one or the other. So that's right. We're, we're, all in, we're all general internists, but some of us choose to practice in the hospital and some choose to practice in the clinic. Is there something that makes a applicant competitive to get into internal medicine? Into internal medicine residency? Yeah. Gosh, good question. I, you know, I think that absolutely, you know, uh, solid grades in your first few years of, of coursework as a medical student are incredibly important. I think because internal medicine is such a broad field, having a really a really good understanding of physiology, pathophysiology. I mean, everything that goes into our medical education is incredibly important. I think that absolutely a diverse range of clinical experience during, you know, your ward years as a medical student is important. And I honestly, I think that the more diverse months in a hospital that you can do as a medical student are incredibly helpful and informative for internal medicine residency, because internists are often the ones interfacing with specialists, especially our surgical specialists, and then other internal medicine subspecialists, the more that you can understand how those all kind of fit together, I think is incredibly helpful. I do think, you know, depending on what your interests are, if you want to also be a, a researcher on top of clinical medicine, I absolutely think that, you know, getting a, a background in, in research 
um, as a medical student can be very important. I think one thing, you know, that's it's a little different with internal medicine than other fields is that there are there is a diversity of clinical practices that you can eventually find yourself in, you know, after training, meaning that, you know, internal medicine is the gateway to, like I said, primary care. It's the gateway to hospital-based medicine. It's also the gateway to subspecialties such as gastroenterology, such as hepatology, hematology, oncology, you know, endocrinology. So there are, are many subspecialties that, you, you know, you can consider beyond internal medicine training if, if general medicine isn't appealing to you. Is matching pretty competitive for internal medicine? So it can be. I think that there are, you know, several very, very high powered academic institutions that are, are very, very competitive. Those, you know, are, are located all over the country. I think that there are, so if you are so inclined to end up in, in that kind of program, it's highly competitive. That said, there are many other different kinds of programs throughout the country. So it just depends on what your goals are for training. I think that, you know, there's, depending on what you're interested in, whether it be research or clinical medicine or a hybrid of both, or if you're interested in doing, you know, another degree on top of of medicine, those are helpful to think about in going into the application and matching process. So there's a wide range out there. Do you see any bias between osteopathic physicians and allopathic physicians when it comes to applying for internal medicine? You know, good question. I didn't encounter that myself, but I don't, I'm not sure that I necessarily have a, you know, have a clear or direct experience with that. You know, my program was, my residency program was majority MD. There are a few DOs that have come through our program. I, you know, anecdotally, just from my personal experience, the top internal medicine residencies typically only look at MD candidates. I'm not sure if that's right or wrong, but uh, I would say that's what I have seen in my experience. Okay. Are there any opportunities as a hospitalist to further subspecialize? As a hospitalist to further subspecialize, I, you know, sometimes it depends a little bit on the place where you practice. So for example, in a more rural setting or a a smaller town, typically you will just find general hospitalists, meaning they take care of general internal medicine patients. They may or may not also take care of ICU level patients themselves in a, typically in, in bigger cities. There are opportunities to have a more specialized subset of patients you care for. For example, at our hospital, there is a team of hospitalists that only takes care of complicated GI and liver patients. So that's their subset of patients that they typically see. And at uh, UCSF, uh, another hospital um, in San Francisco, there is a team of hospitalists that only cares for the bone marrow transplant patients. It's their subset. And they work very closely with the the hematologists, oncologists in caring for those patients. So I would say that the vast majority of hospitalists practice general hospital medicine and are not subspecialized, but in larger cities or in institutions that have a high volume of specialized patients, there is an opportunity to specialize uh, within your hospitalist practice. And is are those specialists, is that a fellowship training or extra training, or is it just that's the type of patient they're drawn to and they seek out those opportunities? I would say there typically is not further academic medical training. I usually each hospital or each practice has their own culture about, you know, how they train the subspecialty hospitalists. Often it's just getting to know the complex GI attendings and learning how they, you know, the ways that they care for their patients, given that you're sort of the liaison between the patient and their specialist. And for example, within the, the more specialized oncology realm, you work closely with those specialty oncologists to, to care for patients based on sort of the, the standards of care that relate to their illness. So to, to more specifically answer your question, there is not typically formal training 
on top of residency, but you sort of learn within your institution as you go. Okay. What do the boards look like for internal medicine? The internal medicine board exam is at this point every 10 years. So most people complete their three-year internal medicine residency in the month of, of June and then spend a few months of that summer studying hard uh, for the exam and then take the exam that usually August or September and then start their clinical practice in whatever they're going into or they matriculate into a fellowship program if they've decided to specialize. The board exam is taken, at least when I took it three years ago, on a, uh, on a computer and it's multiple choice. It's a full day exam. I think I was there for about seven and a half hours. And then you, after taking the exam, you know, you have about six or eight weeks, I want to say, until you get your written results back. And they tell you if you passed or failed. Do you know what the pass rates look like? Ooh, great question. The pass rates are pretty high. I would say that this is an exam that most people do well on. And by well, I mean they pass. So your actual raw score doesn't really matter in terms of, you know, the job that you're going to get or anything, you know, that happens down the road, which is much different than, you know, your USMLE type exam where your score really matters because you're no longer competing, you know, for a spot. Typically, people have already matched for fellowship or they already have a job. So you're really just trying to pass the exam. And I would say, I unfortunately don't know the number off the top of my head, but I would say it's, you know, definitely the majority pass. And I would say it's probably closer to, you know, a 75 or or 85% pass rate. Knowing what you know now after being in practice for a couple of years, what do you wish you would have known going into your residency? Wow, there are so many ways to uh, answer that question. I think that, you know, I, I think that what I realize now is that during residency, you work really, really, really hard. You spend so many, you know, thousands of hours physically in the hospital. And I think that it's really easy to get bogged down by the pressure of residency, of performing well, of taking good care of patients, getting bogged down by just being really tired, um, which of course, you know, we're all human beings and that happens. I think that I would have, if I could tell myself day one of residency, you know, if I give myself some, some advice, I would say, you know, make sure that you use this time to learn as much as you possibly can. Because it's such an intense environment, as I'm, you know, describing, I think really making the most of every learning opportunity, even when you're tired, even when you're ready to like turn the pager off and go home and go to sleep. Um, I think that it's time that, you know, you'll never have again in a teaching environment where you can learn from experts, get experiences that you may never have an opportunity to have again. And I think building building the idea of lifelong learning into your clinical practice as a resident is really important because when you finish, you may not still be practicing in an academic environment or a place in which there's a specialist to call and ask a question, or, you know, you really should constantly be learning and figuring out the ways that you can best access new information in order to take the best possible care of patients. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I absolutely think that, you know, physicians need to recognize that, you know, in order, in order to be up on the, on the latest information, it takes a lot of work. And so including that time into your clinical practice is, is really important. What do you wish non-hospitalist primary care physicians I guess as a hospitalist, you don't call yourself a primary care physician. So what do you wish primary care physicians knew about hospitalists to better help you do your job? I wish that primary care doctors who, you know, have formed a relationship with their panel of of patients and have maybe known them for a long time, I wish that they would recognize that as a hospitalist, we do our very best in a incredibly brief encounter with these patients to get to know them, to 
you know, formulate a treatment plan with the patient and their family together. And then it's a challenge when you really have to build rapport quickly with someone. You're literally just walking into the room and meeting them for the first time. So I would say to my primary care colleagues, especially patients that you've known a long time who maybe have a chronic illness or several, whether it be, you know, a heart failure or cancer, I think it's incredibly important for primary doctors to inform their patients as much as they can about their medical problems and to discuss prognosis, especially when related to a serious illness. I can tell you that as a hospitalist, I see many, many patients with, let's use the example of of cancer. People have that I see have, have very advanced cancer. They may not be doing well, which is why they end up in the hospital. And I often am the one that has to break the bad news that that things have gotten worse and they're and they're not doing well and they may have a poor prognosis. And what I really wish is that primary care doctors would would also have that conversation with them earlier on, further upstream before a crisis ensues, such that, you know, as a hospitalist, I'm walking into the room talking to a patient or to a family who maybe has a sense of that. It's very, very helpful for their care overall and for me as a hospitalist. What other specialties do you work the most with? In my practice, I work a lot with the oncologists. We have many patients that interface with our hospital who have cancer. In addition, the cardiologists, as well as our ICU physician. So we're, we're lucky in that we have 24-7 intensive care practice available in the hospital so that we co-manage our sickest patients together. So I would say those three are the top specialists that I uh, tend to work with. Okay. And I'm assuming emergency medicine as well. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yes. That I always forget that sort of goes without saying. Absolutely. So I work most closely out of all of those, I, most closely with our emergency medicine docs. I spend you know, the majority of my time at work physically in the emergency room. Are there any special opportunities outside of clinical medicine specifically for hospitalists? I think that specifically for hospitalists, you know, I think there's opportunities to work in skilled nursing facilities or post-acute care. That's sort of a variation on hospital medicine. I think with your general internal medicine background, you know, there are opportunities in biotechnology, especially here, you know, in San Francisco, there's uh, Silicon Valley is full of companies that are interested in, in getting the expertise from practicing general internists. So there are, there are many jobs out there. I would say that's probably the, the majority of the outside work that comes to mind for internists. What do you like the most about being a hospitalist? I love feeling like I'm a detective. I really enjoy especially working at night, having patients who are what I call undifferentiated, meaning, you know, I, I know what they're coming in the hospital with, meaning a, a chief complaint, but I don't really know what's wrong with them. So I like digging in and, you know, using diagnostics to, to figure out what is it that's going on based on their medical history and, and what we can use in order to figure it out. So I enjoy the variety of, uh, of patients that come in, it keeps me on my toes. What do you like the least about being a hospitalist? What do I like the least? Sometimes as a hospitalist, you get stuck in the middle a little bit. You, you know, we are the, we're the doctors that often are in between the patient and their specialist. So if a patient comes in with you know, advanced heart failure, we admit them to the hospital, we put a treatment plan in place, and then we call their cardiologist or we call a cardiologist to come and see them and give recommendations based on, you know, what, what's going on. And so sometimes it's, it's a little tricky to be caught in the middle. It's often wonderful and it's very helpful to have those specialists weigh in on patient care. But sometimes it's just navigating, you know, the needs of the patient your own needs as a hospitalist and then the needs of, of the specialist. And so that can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. If you had to do it all over again, would you still choose to be a hospitalist? I think so. 
Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying my practice as a, as a hospitalist. I think, you know, going back to your question earlier about medical school, I, I wish I would have gotten more exposure to other fields. Like, for example, I find neurology fascinating and wish I would have spent more time as a med student exploring that to see if it was a good fit for me. Additionally, anesthesiology is a very exciting field. And I wish that beyond my, you know, fourth year elective, I would have had more exposure because I think it potentially could have changed the outcome of my ultimate practice. But I would say all in all, I love internal medicine. I'm, I'm very happy as a hospitalist. So that's my answer. <laughs> Do you see any major changes in the hospitalist realm in the future? You know, I, I'm not sure. I think that there potentially are many changes on every front within medicine in the future, whether it's the near future, I'm not quite sure. You know, for me as a hospitalist, I can't really pinpoint anything specific at this time. I definitely think that hospital medicine, while it's a fairly new field, it's here to stay. We serve, you know, an excellent purpose. One thing I would love to see more of is is better communication between primary care doctors and hospitalists. I think it's that's often a, a challenge given, you know, we sometimes use different electronic health records or, you know, having to call somebody, uh, track them down in clinic on the phone can be a challenge. But I think it's incredibly important for continuity of care that we're in good communication. Beyond that, I'm not sure what's on the horizon. Any last words of wisdom for students possibly looking into hospitalist medicine? Hmm. I think that the beauty of hospital medicine is that if you're looking for flexibility in your schedule, it's a great field. So every hospital practice is set up differently. So when, you know, looking, when you're looking into the a career as a hospitalist, you know, if, if you want to, you know, have weeks off at a time potentially, or, you know, only work nights or work a variety of times um, on different days. I think that, you know, hospital medicine can be a perfect career. All right. Again, that was Shoshana. Thank you very much for sharing your story of being a hospitalist and the path it takes and hopefully motivating students to look into hospital medicine. If you liked Shoshana and you want to hear more of her, I'm going to have her back on the pre-med years podcast to talk about one of her other passions, and that's palliative care. So keep an eye out for that podcast. Again, that will be on the pre-med years. I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. Let me know where you are in your journey. Since this is a newer podcast, I'm interested to know who's listening if you would email me, ryan at medicalschoolhq.net, and just tell me a little bit about yourself, I would love to hear your story. And let me know if there's anything that I can do to help you on your path. I hope you have a great week, and we'll catch you next week, hopefully. Again, I I always, at the beginning of this podcast, I didn't guarantee a weekly podcast, but we're doing well. So I hope to see you next week here at the Specialty Stories Podcast.